you know, when I was when I was about 13 years old, because of things that were going on in the house, I was given away on on Christmas Day. I mean, how do you just be given away? Not that my mom wanted to give me away, I but that's just you. kind of how it happened. Yes. My body started feeling hot. Mm. And I didn't know what was going on, what to do. And I'm trying to play it cool because that's what you do when you've been through a lot of stuff in your life. You just, let me just, you know, let me get some water. Let me just be okay. Uh And then I woke up. I was in a bed. Mm. I had these little red shorts on. Uh, There were people in front of the bed. And uh, I had been drugged. And I was in that place for what I thought was four days. I was there for three weeks, and I had been wow, baby. given a drug, GHB and crystal meth, that held me there. <laughs> you know. What's going on? How's everybody? The food good, is good. 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 Hopefully it is. Hopefully oh, wow. it is. I think you enjoy it. I can't wait. So what we got cooking? Sweet chili coconut shrimp. Shrimp covered in coconut and fried golden brown and served with sweet chili sauce. This appetizer is quick to disappear. Mm. And then for, of course, you know, you get the bird. All right. Oh, right. He likes the bird. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Looks delicious. So y'all, y'all look very eclectic today. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you. Uh, hey. Yes. <laughs> this is my favorite Chris hair That's so far. Oh. Oh. Thank you. What do you think? Oh. I like it. You it's like kind of, it? It, it takes me back to the 80s. Yes. Oh, that was, that was it. Hey. You know, be starting something. You got to be starting yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Come on, props to Michael. I swear, I swear. You said the icon, baby, there. Yeah. Worldwide. <laughs> Speaking of worldwide, so we know how uh, here in America, the, the vision or the thought of gays in America is changing. You know, okay. constantly, daily. Yes. But when literally. you travel outside the United States, do you have any fears or any thoughts or anything run through your head? Like, depends yeah. on where you're going. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. In different countries, in different places, we have to remember we are guests yeah. in True. those places. And so. Well, I don't know. We're Americans. We go everywhere and make it America. Well, we actually Unfortunately. don't. Unfortunately. <laughs> that is what a lot of Americans think, and it is absolutely incorrect and rude. You right? Um, well, and, I have a hard stance on it. Okay. I don't go any place that does not accept gays. Period. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very certain places, clear. I ain't coming. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I agree. Yes, I agree. but I love it. Literally, you know literally. <laughs> <laughs> and to say it's okay, like you're supposed to pack yourself away because you want to visit that country. I, I, I don't. I have a hard time with really supporting an environment that doesn't support me, particularly when I'm there as a guest spending right. money. It's not. Yeah. That's a big difference. Indeed. Our, our guests story. are going to have something True to say story. about that what? too when they arrive. So we're going to have. Um, DeMarco Majors joining us. Okay. Oh, okay. Nice. nice, right. Former pro basketball player DeMarco Majors has lived an unbelievable journey. From humble beginnings being raised by his single mother in Evansville, Indiana with his two sisters, to playing professional basketball internationally as a star on teams in Australia, Brazil, and Argentina. While still playing professionally, DeMarco came out as gay, which resulted in him becoming one of the first black gay men to grace the cover of Out magazine. This opened the door to numerous calls for acting and modeling opportunities. While still a rising star, DeMarco endured a cataclysmic tragedy. From the ashes, he discovered his new journey into self-discovery and acceptance. Now, DeMarco is on a crusade to save lives and be an example of resilience. Working as a life coach, he is using fitness as a motivational tool to achieve one's life goals. So has anyone been to a place that 
is more gay accepting or gay friendly than the U.S. That, or as Ooh. much? That's a great question. Gay friendly or gay accepting? Which one is which one is the U.S.? <laughs> 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 Those are two separate things. That, huh? That's a good point, Cheryl. Yes, I was trying to digest the that too. Yes. Like, I would, how would you clarify that? I, I would I would say uh, Israel. I would say mm. is more gay friendly. Uh, the, the U.S. US. At, at, as a whole, yeah. Interesting. I, but that's from your experience? Well, if, well, check this out. They had, they have the Eurovision contest. You know what that is? Mm. It's like a it's like an American idol for all of Europe. Okay. And then back in, I think, the 70s, they had, their, each country sends a representative. So mm. they sent a transgender singer mm. who won the contest. And uh, they took a poll in the country, you know, do you think Donna Internacional is a good representation of Israel, and the majority of the country said yes. So now, what were you, so you've been to Israel, you've traveled. Yeah, yeah. How I lived long there did for you stay there? three years. I lived there. Yeah. Did wow. you experience that when you were in Israel? Oh uh, yeah, I I was engaged in a sense, uh, and that ended, and it ended in such a bad way mm -hmm. that I was so heartbroken mm -hmm. that I told myself I would never feel this again, mm -hmm. and I haven't. So you talked a lot mm -hmm. about the experiences here in the U.S. in terms of people responding to you in a less than favorable way. Mm -hmm. When you were in Israel for those three years and just moving comfortably through the country, what was your experience? Thank you for asking that. I used to do drag in Israel, in Jerusalem. Wow. Mm -hmm. I used to, oh my gosh, like the first time they, I ever got paid to do drag, it was in Israel, in Jerusalem. They mm -hmm. actually really loved me. I have videos on YouTube. And mm -hmm. I remember leaving the drag bar uh, two, three in the morning, and walking all the way across Jerusalem in drag to get to my apartment. Mm. Never Safe? a problem. Never a problem. Not one. Whoa. So were their standards of drag different, or just was it, um... You're saying I wasn't a good <laughs> drag queen, so they didn't... No. <laughs> oh, no. Mm -hmm. Is that well... what <laughs> <laughs> They didn't care. <laughs> They're like, this is not well, even I worth mean, my I time. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what drag in Jerusalem looks like. I'm... Mm -hmm. I've seen some of the, the drag looks that you have created, and so I'm just wondering um, that the level of the level of drag that you're doing is um, it's 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 a bit n novice. Yeah, and it's a, and the point is not about like how good my drag is, but the point, and this is it is remarkable that I could walk from one side of town to through this main city to the other side of town in in drag. I'm clearly a man in heels and a wig, you know, probably doing a, a horrible strut. I don't know if they thought I was a streetwalker or what they thought, but I never had a problem. You never mm -hmm. felt scared? And I, and I would never do that. And I can't think of any city in America where I would do that. I, like, literally none. So what made you feel so comfortable to do it there? That's the vibe of the city. The mm -hmm. vibe of the city is mm -hmm. everyone lives their own life. Are so you did kidding? you see more drag I your flight. <laughs> pedestrians who look... <laughs> Like street walkers, and then you thought I'd fit in. No, like I'm just trying to. Understand. I never, I never saw any other drag queens walking around. I mean, they would, you know, take the taxis to get to the club and maybe taxi home. You know, I just was probably trying to save so money. Then so then, what I made you feel so brave to do it there in another country, in another place? That's Why did you feel so comfortable to do that? Like, what did they do differently than what happens here in the U.S. that you said, "Yes, I can do that"? Mm -hmm. Maybe crime rates are lower. I think that they have a system where the where every citizen goes to the military, and then once you're out of the military, you have like off-duty military. So there's kind of always someone around uh, with probably a weapon on them. <laughs> and if anything gets oh. crazy, you know, and, and there has been situations where like there was an attempted terrorist attack, and an off-duty officer stopped it. So that probably plays a part in it. But you know, it just I wasn't. So thinking you that. had no negative response ever. Ever none. Zero. In three I years. Went, I went even before so, my drag show. Why are show. you so surprised by that? It's almost as if, I don't know, you're suggesting that either it's hard to believe or... I've traveled the world and, mm. in other, other countries, and I just, I, um, I've never been to Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, it's, my shock is I've been to Spain, I've been to Italy, I've been to France, I've been to London, I've been to South Africa, mm -hmm. I've been to all Beautiful. of these other places. Beautiful. And I can't imagine walking in a modest drag, mm -hmm. you know, late at night mm -hmm. from one place to another and everyone just thinking, okay, 
Hmm. You were okay. Out of all those the, and, and feeling through. safe. Like I, I, and again, coming from the U.S. where I don't feel safe to do that. So in mm. a place that I don't feel safe mm. to do that, I go to a completely different country, and now I prance around. Did you do that before you went to Israel or after? I mean, I probably have done a couple of draggy things in the U.S., but I would never do them out, like, walking, walking around town. Wa walking down the street in drag is something that I've never done except in Jerusalem. And I think that it speaks to, and I can't speak for with what's going on there today, but when I was there... How long I, ago? Yeah, this was probably in 2000 and... Uh, between 2007 and 2010. Okay. That is when I was there. Okay. And I did feel safe the, the whole time walking in drag. I went to, do my, to get my drag makeup. I would go into the department store where they do wow. the makeup beauty counter. And, they would do it and I'm like, hey, no. I have a drag show coming up. She's like, oh! And for me, oh, I, wait and minute, the thing that's so much I'm wait, excited wait, 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 the excuse me. this could be, hold wait. on one second, Joe, okay. that we could actually, that there could be a place, I don't know of a place, that we're, we're like this, because I don't have, I don't know of that place here in the U.S., and I've not been to Jerusalem. Right. So, the, so for me, my surprise is the, the, the excitement around, wow, there's a place that's that open and welcoming. Makes and I want to go. And I, and right, I did not, I didn't right. realize that. Well, well now, could I ask my question? Because I haven't traveled. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, for the, I, I haven't had the opportunity. In all the countries you've been, it does, it, were they welcoming to drag or not? Was there drag there? Drag was not my thing, so I wasn't mm -hmm. looking for that. That wasn't something okay. that I was trying to, yeah. you know. I, I would say drag was there, but mm -hmm. again, I wasn't there doing drag, right. so uh -huh. I'm moving through the environment in a very different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But most of most gay communities around the country, drag is a part of it. Yeah. Right. Around the world, Literally. I'm sorry. I mean, See, I anywhere you go. I, I guess I was trying to zero in on, and, and maybe I'm stuck on, on what we were talking about earlier, in how we move through the world. So there's a way we move through the U.S., but then when you start talking globally and you start making decisions about where you want to go and what you expect when you get there, like do you do right. research before you go? Like, right, good point. Some of us go to these other countries and we go in the closet while we're in those other countries. I travel to these countries with my husband, mm -hmm. you know, and move very comfortably the same way I do here, not mm -hmm. anticipating that there's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, in those countries that are known to for that to be an issue, like I said earlier, I and don't I go there. And, and I think, that, and I think that that's a very different. That's a very good point. I traveled to these countries when I was a lot younger, mm -hmm. and up to now. And when I was a lot younger, traveling to these countries, I traveled alone. So, so that when you are maneuvering alone, you do have to function differently because you you are your only protector. You don't have someone that's got your back or that's looking out for you, or there's no security. So you were in Jerusalem with the person. You traveled with the person. No, I'm sure alone. you traveled. Oh, you were alone? Yes. Oh, so you were alone when you did this? Yes. OK, and so that's I thought that I the met, That's where I met Oh, you the, met the them person, there. yes. OK, I misunderstood right. that. OK. Mm -hmm. So when I was traveling alone, I felt very comfortable, and I did not. You know, I was in no way pretending like, you know, I wasn't being my authentic self. But again, my fascination was with the drag piece, because mm. I had, I, I get what I you're never, saying. I didn't see a lot of people walking in drag and, when I was at, when I was out. Yeah, and in you these even have places. the courage to even do it in another country when you know how brutal it is here. And a person from drag from another country doing it. Uh -huh. So that you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So that so that for it. me that was it, it was something that I had never experienced. Uh, okay, I get it. But <laughs> he lived in Jerusalem. It wasn't like he just went there for the weekend and decided to prance around in a dress. He was living there for three years and yeah. just doing makeup and and didn't. Go down. That's a good yeah. thing. It, yeah. it was a great thing. It was a great know, thing. You know, I, I, I I'm think, just, yeah. I guess I'm surprised that there's so much surprise that <laughs> that, that could be possible. I gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, so, I will accept that. I think we all want to get to Jerusalem. <laughs> and I need to go to <laughs> Jerusalem. Right okay. And, and but group, I'm not going to go. Group drag. trip. <laughs> Let's go together. <laughs> and you're not even going to drag. Absolutely not. So it's. <laughs> So it, it was a non-issue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I I do I want to say something about it. Go ahead. And so well, for me, it was information. Because I think this idea finish, of traveling say one thing. with a partner. Oh, okay, y'all got me. Because when you are traveling with a partner, mm -hmm. you're more, it, it's more obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So like what, when we check into hotels, yeah. And, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Most tourist environments now, the one thing about the gay dollar, everybody's trying to court it. All right now. And whether they like you or don't like you, 
they can tolerate you long enough and give you the kind of service that you deserve. Okay. Right. Uh, so I'm also sensitive to that. Yeah, you're right. So your staff, top to bottom, I mean, the respect needs to be there at every level. Yeah. And so I do do that kind of research. And, and like I said, many of the countries you've named, London, yeah. Italy, Spain, all of those, I've never had any problems. It's actually it's been very, very welcoming. Yes. Um, very, very respectful. Well, but then you also were having an elevated experience. Please, please, please. You were having an elevated experience. There are a lot of gays wait that go to these places that are not in hotels. They're in hostels. They're students. So, okay. So I'm saying, so that's a different. Cheryl, can we, I, I hear you. Oh. Can we come, can we sure. pick it up we come back? We will go to break and come back and jump right in. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, Cheryl. I just, I needed to say that because because that's a different experience than what I, I was referring you. to. Look, nothing's going to upset Cheryl. <laughs> I go to the break, baby. All Cheryl, you were saying before we went to break? Uh, I was going to say that I haven't, like I said, haven't traveled, haven't had that luxury, but I have been to uh, Rotterdam and I was riding a bus. And I'm glad you are telling and role modeling how you should research places before you go. Be and then uh, I was, hi, hi, like that. And then finally, uh, I thought they were, they were white, very fair, with blue eyes. And two people said, are you from this? You're not from this country. I said, no, I'm visiting from everywhere. Like, you got to stop laughing and, and saying hello. And I was like, what? They say, they'll take you to jail. They'll think you drunk. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's how serious it is. And you all know because you travel. I didn't know it was that serious. Yeah, there's a lot of weird. I went to Korea and, and did not know that if you spit, it's against the law. You know, there's just like a lot of weird differences how around weird. the world. And if you don't know, you can get, get caught up. Yeah. You can Google before you go. And you can ask, what things should I look out for that's as right. American traveling X? What should I be mindful of? I suggest doing the research. It was sort of like what Sean was alluding to, you know, earlier um, in the kitchen, which was the idea that we're Americans. We can just kind of go and just do, be Americans wherever we go. No, but that is, that is an impression that many people have. That is not the case. You are a guest. You're mm -hmm. a visitor mm -hmm. in someone else's country. Mm -hmm. So your rules here in America do not apply in their country. Absolutely. Well, let, let's see what our, our guest thinks about this. Yes, and he's not ugly at all. No, no. At all. No. <laughs> at all. <laughs> hey, DeMarco, how are you? <laughs> Good. That's an air hug. Yeah, 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 but that's how we do it. You know, that's how we you do it. Absolutely. Good to see you. This Thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen. Here. Have a seat. Oh, wow, I am in the house. Yes, 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 How is everybody yes, yes. doing? How are you? you know, I feel like I made it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in L.A. I'm at the house. Hello. How We're are you glad doing? you're here. How are you doing? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, What's thank going you. on? We've been having quite an interesting conversation okay. about world travel, uh, particularly as queer people, you know, wherever you fit along the spectrum, and whether or not we should comport ourselves differently. How do we decide where to go, not to go? I mean, we're curious about, you know, we want to, of course, invite you to the conversation. Oh, and, we got you. Oh, here's our, here's our chef. We got you a place. Wow. Yes. This, is, wow. this is Sean. This looks good. How you doing, Sean? Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure, Pleasure to meet Welcome you. Welcome to the house. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Garlic shrimp skewers and creamy polenta. This Creole dish is shrimp marinated in garlic butter, skewered and grilled, and served with the creamy cornmeal polenta. This will have your mouth watering for more. Enjoy, guys. Of course, you get the bird. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's fake. I'm allergic to shellfish. OK, OK. <laughs> so we're wondering if you have any thoughts on that topic. Um, when it comes down to traveling, because this sounds like one of those um, sundown kind of type of conversations. Ooh. You know, where tell do you people go? What that, tell people well, what that we, means. You're talking about safe spaces and safe places to travel for black people for them to be safe. And when the sun goes down, mm. The safety goes away. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happens, you know, it tends to happen when we travel as well. I can definitely understand, uh, but we're living in such different times today. However, some people's mentality and understanding of the times are still in those places. Because you still have people who grew up, you know, thinking that, you know, being told it's wrong to be gay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But it's not wrong to be racist. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So now you have a different conversation. So when we're traveling, mm -hmm. first things first, one of the smartest things we could ever do for ourselves is 
research someone else's culture and heritage, mm. not just for you to feel safe, but for you to be respectful. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. You know? Have yeah. you traveled a lot? I have traveled a lot. I've been very, very fortunate that a lot of things in my career have taken me to places in, you know, Argentina, Brazil, wow. New Zealand, Fiji, um, Hawaii, yeah. Singapore, Tokyo. Um, I've been very fortunate in the traveling and that traveling opportunity. What's the career? Career? Well, I got to uh, be a professional basketball player oh, and I got yes, to yes, model yes. for the last 20 years in many different countries around wow. the world. Nice, so nice. Basketball. You were also on a basketball show, right? <laughs> right. Yes. Like yes. You've grown yes, up yes, yes. since the show. Yes, right? I've grown up and I've grown out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm having a good time. Uh -huh. You know, uh, the TV show was called Shirts and Skins. Yep. Yeah, I remember that show. Remember it, was, it was groundbreaking. It mm -hmm. was one of really those was. moments that, you know, you never seen a TV show about a basketball team. And not to mention, a gay basketball team. Mm -hmm. Wow. And not only did we have that, you didn't see black queer representation anywhere. Mm. What and year was that? That was in 2008. Okay. Wow. When you think about that experience back in 2008, how were you able to leverage the, that platform and other things that you went on to do? That platform gave me the opportunity to really look at my life and to mm. walk away from basketball. Because I learned, due to the tr different traumas that have been in my life, I trauma bonded with basketball. Mm. Because I really wanted to be, I really wanted to see what acting was like and what modeling was like mm. and just to, what that freedom was like because everything in my life was so restricted. Mm. However, being on the show and us putting that out there mm -hmm. and giving people a different look, I got an opportunity to see love from many different angles. So then I got the courage. Because I was nice. discouraged at first. Tell people what you mean when you say you get trauma bonded with basketball. Well, what That's I mean by- That's a powerful statement. It truly is. Mm. It truly is. I never um, what I mean by trauma bonding is that I had coaches and different staff who did the yelling and the drilling into you. And you know, everybody says, you know, in sports, you got to be strong and you got to do this and you got to do that. However, when you come from um, more of an underprivileged neighborhoods. You know, come from urban areas. You come from a lot of yelling, screaming, traumatic episodes, gun violence, death. And then you go to these coaches who take young black men come and they now. scream and they yell at you. And you don't realize that you're actually being abused. Wow. You don't realize what's going on. It's because you're so familiar and so invested into the sport because the only thing that's on your mind how can I turn this into a check to save my family? Ooh, that's so pressure. I bonded with that, and I was willing to do whatever it took yes. at every step, every moment of the way. What was the turning point? By healing my voice first. Mm -hmm. Your voice is your identity and sound. I don't want the fear, the shame, the guilt to be on the frequency of my words, because when you hear my words, I want you to feel that triumph to feel that love. I don't want you to trauma bond with those words. We always think that struggle is a requirement for us, just so that we can bond. Spit that heat. <laughs> I don't have to trauma bond with you, but I can bond in love with you. So healing the frequency of my vocabulary first, because a lot of the words that I learned mm -hmm. in my formative years and my subconscious before seven years old, was trauma, it was hurt, mm -hmm. it was shame. So once you healed your voice, what came next? Mm. Um, shame. Mm. The recognition of it, the exploration of it, the what? The acceptance, the acceptance of, it. of it. Talk a little bit about that. A lot of the times in our lives when we, we were never even taught that there are two different forms of shame. There's a healthy shame and there's a toxic shame. Never heard it. Yeah. I learned so much toxic shame, especially, you know, being an athlete and being in locker rooms and being around tons of people because Guess what? What? I'm still under those same rules. Be seen and not heard. Mm. Shrink. So other people can feel bigger. And feel better. Why do I have to play small to make you Ooh. feel comfortable? Preach. See, I almost cut. Stop. I'm uh -uh. <laughs> I almost cut. Uh -uh. You don't. You don't. You have. spit. You don't. Have. I read an article uh, about you, and it talks about the things you've experienced 
and it's almost like this can't be real. Tell <laughs> like, us. So I read about Ooh. an abduction. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when I first got to New York, I was out and about running around, and I was looking for a, a room to rent. All this other stuff. Around what age um, are we talking? I was 29 years okay, old. Okay, go on. And right before my 30th birthday, um, went to a room, and I, you know, met with the person, all this other stuff, and then, you know, I was asked if I would like, you know, something to drink. He's like, you know, I have some Coke and all this other stuff, and I was like, cool. Brought me, uh, you know, a cup of Coke, you know, and a, a styrofoam cup, and I barely have a sense of smell. My nose was broken twice in a basketball game, and so took a sip of the drink, and my body started feeling hot. I didn't know what was going on, and then the people pleaser in me started to get scared, and I didn't know what was going on, what to do, and I'm trying to play it cool because that's what you do when you've been through a lot of stuff in your life. You just, let me just, you know, let me get some water, let me just be okay. And then I woke up. I was in a bed. I had these little red shorts on. Uh, there were people in front of the bed. And uh, I had been drugged. Mm. And I was in that place for what I thought was four days. I was there for three weeks. And I had been wow, baby. given a drug, GHB and crystal meth, oh. that held me there. And the paranoia, the fear, you think you're hearing oh cops God. and everything screaming at you. And how I was able to even get out of that situation is I talk like this when I was able to talk. And the person actually uh, started to fall in love with me and forgot to give the drugs. And once I got strong enough, I actually looked at him, walked out and looked at him and said, I can't watch you kill yourself. Wow. And I walked out and ran and he let me, and he just let me go, and I ran to T-Mobile and I asked someone. I said, "Can you please give me my phone record so I can find the phone number?" Because the phone that I had, the charger was broke off into the phone, mm -hmm. so the phone was not use, use. I couldn't use it anymore. So, in my mind, I don't know how I was even able to ask that question. Grace. So, yes. asked the question, called my friend. He was just like, "Where have you been?" And he said to me, "You know." Please tell me that, you know, you weren't this place and this place. He said, just jump in a cab, get up here. And so I went to his place in Harlem. We sat and we talked. Um, I didn't realize everything that was going on because it's still, even to this day, it's still kind of foggy. foggy. And he took me to the doctor the next day. And that was what happened to me. For you to be able to say your truth, you were role modeling. What happened to those people that did that to you? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what happened to them. Um, I don't e didn't even know the people. Mm. Honestly, to this day, I still can't even picture faces. And I remember being, I remember being scared, frightened, pissed off. I remember, you know, calling my mom and walking around and like, you know, I'm I'm going crazy. I'm gonna kill somebody. I'm gonna do something. Mm. To who? Wow. So I'm looking mm. at I'm looking at everyone as a potential, yes. like you about to do something to me. But at the same time that existed in that moment was your body's calling for a drug mm -hmm. that you never had a relationship with, you never oh, even tried. Oh, wow. So now you have an addiction. Oh my wow. <sighs> and that was strong because now we know what crystal meth does. Oh, oh yes. yes. And how, you know, how rampant it is in our communities right oh, now. God. And Every moment that I get an opportunity just to breathe and smile when I breathe, because I don't do that anymore. Mm. We're going to take a break right here, and we'll come back and, and pick up. Thank All you right. so much. Some food. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. No mm. Beautiful spirit. So before we left to the break, you were talking about these cravings and realizing that there was some kind of connection to, to methamphetamine. Was that something that you, that it happened during the abduction and you were now dealing with that? Or it was a retrospective kind of, help us understand a little bit more about that. 
meth is highly addictive, mm -hmm. highly addictive. Even when you don't know what it is, there, it, just, there, it just kind of calls you and it's magnetic to you. And it doesn't come to you as the drug. Mm -hmm. It comes to you as the emotion. And it preys on the dominant emotion that you're most shameful of, fearful of. So in your case, which emotion was it? Um, <laughs> I want to say all of them <laughs> because there was just so much trauma in my youth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? You know, when I, was, when I was about 13 years old, because of things that were going on in the house, I was given away on, on Christmas Day. Not that my mom wanted to give me away, I but that's just you. kind of how it happened. Yes. Carrying that from that day, the abandonment yeah. was the real deep mm -hmm. core mm -hmm. issue. Yep. I mean, how do you just be given away? I'm sorry. Well, um, my mom asked my grandfather if I could spend the night. Mm -hmm. And that night turned into, you know, the next day and then the next day. I see. Honestly, the way I see it, as the healed man, as the kid, I was pissed off, I was hurt, I was sad. You know, why doesn't anybody love me? What's wrong with me? Been and there. then I've been there. the queer part of me that didn't know that there was a queer part of me was like, I must be evil. I must be going, you know, I must be going to hell. Being a kid from the 80s, I must gonna get AIDS and die. Yeah. So when the addiction came, it preyed on all of those emotions, mm -hmm. all of those chemical components in my brain. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you meet somebody who is handsome, mm -hmm. good looking, charming, and they have the drug. Mm. Not only did I engage in it, not only did I do it, it did me. Let me tell you something. Meth wore me out. And not that I was like strung out on the streets and homeless and all this other stuff, because that's not what it looked like for me. Mm -hmm. Because the people that were in the areas when I was, when we did this, yes. were Affluent. way up there Affluent. in this uh, world and in this business and all that stuff. So it didn't look like that. And it, because it was once every three months, because you don't want nobody to think that, you know, that you're on it. You don't want nobody, you don't want your teeth to fall, fall out. out, you know. I was you, thinking that when you yeah, said that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I came out and, you know, I was a virgin until I was 24, you know, and I, to me, that was the first time I was told I was attractive. So I just got cute. <laughs> so I was 20, I was 29 years old and I just got cute. I wasn't trying to give that away, uh -uh. but I couldn't control this addiction because it wasn't just the smoke of the substance. meth and that substance. It was, oh my God, the paranoia, the yeah. fear. And then when it amplified, then again, here you are in this thing, in this addiction, and the people who are bringing this to you are attractive and they're mm. beautiful. Mm. It's the demon. Yes. Now with meth, oh, often in the gay community in, in particular, baby. sex is tied to it too. Was that a part of your the experience? Demon, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um, sex was tied to it. Mm. More so, it was not to be alone, not to feel mm. alone. Mm. So some of the times you'll be in these places, in these rooms, and every, people be hanging out, and you would think like everybody's having sex and it's this orgy because that's all you hear about. Mm -hmm. It'd be a bunch of hurt people talking like this in a room, high as hell. Mm -hmm. uh, they fool around a little bit and then they get into these conversations and you felt like you wasn't alone. Mm. Mm. Some kind of connection. So that, okay, I'm, I'm trying to wrap myself around the, um, when you realized that there was the, the addiction piece, was there any advocates that had been there? Because, you know, he, for me, I'm, I'm emotionally overwhelmed um, just, uh, uh, just around the abduction okay. piece. Um, so then how do you, I just don't know, how, how do you figure out where do you go from here, knowing that, okay, now I'm feeling this urge, but, but now this isn't something you have access to or were familiar with or? To your question and to this moment, especially in the overwhelm, in this very moment, the truth of all of that, that there was no one. And I understand now, because of the acceptance, that that moment happened for me to be who I am now so that we could have this moment 
So this overwhelm for you is not just really overwhelm. It's an opportunity of acceptance because mm -hmm. there's going to be more people that are going to be like me who are in your orbit. Mm -hmm. And now you get more information because we have no one. Mm -hmm. We have no one that looks like us mm -hmm. to have these conversations because when I walked in there, the doctor, and I don't even remember his face because I was just that out of it, not high, traumatized. Yeah, absolutely. So when he's talking, when the person is talking to me and run these tests on me and it Did they believe shame. you? Did they believe what ha happened to you? Yes, only because the person who took me there, it had happened to him. Mm. Jeez. Oh, wow. Okay. So in that moment, it's not that you go searching for a drug okay. and all these other things. Mm. It's, we have to understand that okay. law of attraction, like attract like. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that like energy would draw people to you. And when you're in the big city and everything's mm. moving and all that stuff, mm. All you know how to do, all I've ever known how to do until now, until now, mm. all I knew how to do was suppress, mm. push, go. Because if I stop, I'm going to die. Mm. Crystal meth is a slow death. Okay. And everyone that gets to hear this right now know they never have to use it again. The opportunity for us right now, mm -hmm. because we do not have enough conversations mm -hmm. around the drug. We haven't learned how to heal mm -hmm. so from we the come traumas back, of that. We're gonna take a break and come back and let's hear about the journey to healing. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thank That's you so much. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. The journey no, no, no. to healing. I, these moments right here. Wow. Especially when we feel the overwhelm I've learned that that is the time for breathing. That is the time to take a moment for yourself and just ask. Because right now we're looking for, we're trying to understand. We can accept. And then the overwhelm goes away. And then when we communicate, we're sharing in the joy of it because you're sharing with someone I didn't survive. I'm succeeding from it. There are other people out there right now who are trying their hardest with no help, with no one, and they're trying to survive. But all they see, I, went, I literally walked past a young man as he was sitting in the underpass, and he had a needle in his arm, and he was crying because he didn't want to do it. And you could see the darkness sitting on his shoulder to him crying because he didn't want to do that. That's why we have these moments right here. So yes, I know the overwhelm's there, but the information that we, and the information and the love that we gain from this moment, we get to take that into the world and heal. And it's those walls that you build up with the anger inside to wanna hurt. And that's what that kind of conversation touches. Pain is pain, doesn't matter. Substance is irrelevant, it's the pain inside the trauma we've all faced inside. It's so wonderful. Tears are healing. Yes, yeah. terrifying. Tears are healing. So we're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. And when we come back from the break, we're going to hear about the journey to healing. OK. Yes. Isn't it wonderful to get on? So just before we went to break, DeMarco, um, we had a moment, of course, with my yeah. dear Chris. Yeah. And I mean, clearly, <laughs> this is a, a powerful story, an overwhelming mm -hmm. story, and, and so many other things. And um, I want to jump into the emergence from it, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I, I know we'll get our little top offs here. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, feel free to, to, to um, you know, take us on that journey from where you emerged. Okay. How this emerged for me, um, because I love to, I love to say the story like the phoenix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you rise from the ashes. Right. But there was something that actually came to me first, and that was discouragement. Mm -hmm. But what did that mean to me? Mm -hmm. Discouragement to me meant that I distanced myself from courage. Okay. What did I distance myself from courage with? What was in front of my courage? Fear, shame people-pleasing, mm. trauma. So in order for me to get to the courage, 
I had to take tiny bits of that courage and go say, hey, Shane, I know that you're here. Hey, Fear, I know that you're here, but you can no longer be in the driver's seat. Mm. And what that really looked like, and I know this is going to sound very Hollywood. It's going to sound Hollywood hey, because... that's where we at, baby. Yeah. Send it. I had a dream. Mm. Mm -hmm. There was still a part of me that was attached, like an invisible umbilical cord, to the story in a way that I was scared. Because if I tell people, especially as a black man in this society, they could use my vulnerability against me. Mm. So one afternoon... I was sleeping and I was in the bed and I was knocked out. And then all of a sudden, I see 8th Avenue and I was just like, oh, I should go to Gym Bar because that was, you know, that was my spot in New York. And then all of a sudden, the street turned into this dirt road with these beautiful big green trees. And as I kept walking, I realized that I had walked a mile in my own shoes. Wow. And then I started crying. And then I woke up in tears. And normally, I do not play any music when I'm sleeping, anything like that. Mm. And then I looked down at my phone. Music was playing. The artwork on the song was this beautiful dirt road with these big, beautiful green trees. Wow. And the song that was playing was a meditation song, Letting Go. Mm. I get a call. A guy named Savas said, hey, DeMarco, are you ready to tell your story? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. So when you got the call to tell your story, what did you say and who did you tell it to? Was, when I got the call, it was, um, at that time, he was editor for HIV Plus magazine. Mm -hmm. See, my story wasn't just about, you know, DeMarco, the basketball player, and this TV and the drugs. It was also about accepting my diagnosis as HIV, being HIV positive. So mm. positive, so proud of you. That was part Living of the courage. The truth. Yeah. Oh. We're gonna break right free. here oh, and hear free. more about that courage and all the stuff that's come after that. We'll be right back. Oh, all righty. Thank you. Free. Okay. <laughs> so now that you've got me all emotional and you know <laughs> yeah. this whole abduction and drugs and whoo, <laughs> I know. I'm back with it, baby. I know. I know. I have to get back. I have to get back. But <laughs> now that we're uh, approaching dessert, mm. Mm, Who's I dessert? have to talk about the sweet. <laughs> okay, well, now the South Sweetie, you know how I look. <laughs> I can put some whipped cream on me. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, whipped cream. Oh, uh, is, that, is that what we have? Ooh, yeah. Tonight. Uh, Tonight. No, ice cream. Frozen mudslide and fried Oreo. Vanilla ice cream, chocolate, and coffee liqueur with a chocolate drizzle is blended and served with a deep fried Oreo. You have died and went to chocolate heaven. Mm. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, what I did want to ask you, because Ooh. now, after having this sort of journey that, um, is very heavy, you yeah. know, on some, uh, on a number of levels. Um, and then you, I mean, just listen to your voice and, and your spirit and your energy and how you have been able to over, overcome and, and just be this light of energy Thank around you. something that was so dark. Mm. Um, I think that that is just inspirational on so many levels. Thank you. How, how now do you find love? How do you find mm. a love place? How do you find intimacy and trust? Um, I need you to go back to tears, because these guys... <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my God. Hello. <laughs> okay, you know, it, it was difficult because when you've been in those situations, mm -hmm. you don't realize that you're carrying energy from this person or this person or this situation, mm -hmm. and you don't realize the true heaviness of it all are emotions and energy that you don't own. I had to tell myself, nobody can hurt you with your truth because you own it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got the copyright. I got the trademark. Sure, I might have it too. <laughs> <laughs> so you better check your check your records. Well, you didn't you didn't know you didn't know we was you didn't know we were silent partners. Oh, but, okay, okay. Well, she ain't silent, so you know. I'm a partner. Okay. But okay. I did a devotional okay. on love, letting go, and being a husband for forty days. So okay. that meant now, 
That meant no drinking, no hanging out, mm. no sex, no masturbation, no porn. Me? Darn. Yeah. <laughs> hey, go You know how that is. wore me out? Huh? Oh, you say that wore me out. Hard enough. But it did something else, too. Go ahead. It really, oh, it, yeah. it really did do something else <laughs> to me because it opened me up <gasps> to... Um, I learned in that moment to go away from type. Mm. Go away from what? Type. type. Yeah. Because, you know, when, you, when you're in the no, community. She, explain. She looks confused. <laughs> I'm stuck on the give up masturbation part. Yeah, you know. Oh, darn. Yeah, you know, you know, in this world, you know, I'm not going to be too nasty. I'm not going to get too nasty. Mm. Okay. But I was attached to type because in the community, because you look a certain way, you're supposed to date a certain way. That's what Aaron was talking about earlier, right? What was your type? I didn't know. No. Everyone else okay. had told me that. What did you know, they because, tell you it was? Because I'm muscular and I'm, that I'm tall and that I play sports. So you're supposed to you're supposed to like you know these type of guys who do this and this over here. What is but this and this? This and this meaning like other masculine. Yeah, you know that the prototype. Yes, you know the gay uniform. Yes, yeah, that's the hot type. I don't know gay because I think people don't understand what the gay uniform is. I don't. Okay, I need to hear it out of your mouth. The gay uniform is muscles. Muscular is number one. Okay. Masculine. Okay. Tall. Thank you. And because I talk like this, I'm supposed to like what you think. So people are always trying to set me up or take me to parties or let's go do this around this group of people only. I see. Mm. I didn't vibe with that. You always, you find a tribe that fits your vibe. And when I would talk to these people, mm. the conversations that we were having always revolved around, when'd you come out? Um, who have you dated? Mm. Sexual position. And where do you work out? Sounds rigid. Boring. I'm Ooh, what did the devotion reveal? Sheesh. My devotion revealed that everything, I'm mm. very multifaceted, very multi-layered. Mm. And do you like hats and gloves? <laughs> Chris, would you want to hear about Chris, the devotion? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just had to finish. I've tried to hear about the devotion. <laughs> okay, reveal. Okay. What did the devotion Chris, reveal? I Continue, it. please, DeMarco. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I'm trying to set y'all up. <laughs> he made you cry. We couldn't do that. We did a whole you season. Cry See, you know what? Can, can I cry one time? This, I can, this sounds was... like a family affair. I'm going to sit out of there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do, I really do want to hear about what <laughs> from the devotion, Marco. No, the devotion gave me an opportunity to see that every version of me exists. Any, anybody that I've ever met, Anyone that I've ever talked to, anyone that's ever heard me speak, anyone that's ever read anything from me, there's a version of them of me that exists in their head, and I've mm. got to be okay with all that, with every every version, mm. even mm. even if it doesn't vibe with me. In some people's mind, they may have seen the boisterous or the extrovert or the introvert or the feminine parts. I get to simultaneously exist and accept all of them. So I don't have to create a box for me to fit in. I don't have Ooh. to be, people treat um, your, a sexual position like it's a race of people. I don't have to be Ooh. none of that. I oh. can be all of it Ooh. within yeah. reason yeah. for me. And the only purpose of me and the person that I am choosing either in that moment or over time. That's what the devotion gave. The devotion gave me love and strength and courage to accept that, to say that, and to attract that. Awesome. Whoa. Okay, that's very powerful. That's why I, want, I wanted to Attract to that, that, too. Yeah, that's, once you that's really, really powerful. Became, once you became okay with all those things, then you started attracting your tribe, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And not only was it just a tribe, I got to, I got to heal and reconcile with the kid that was so invisibly visible. And when I did that, I started meeting people in all these different places, all these different countries mm. that wow. loved me oh. as I showed up. Not for the potential that they see me in, because a lot of people just see you in their lust. Ooh. And that's okay too. See you in there. But it wasn't lust. for me, lust. They see you as lust. They would look at my modeling pictures and all that other stuff and they want that dude to show up. But then when I ta start talking, then it takes away, you know, that 
that dream Solomon. persona. Mm. And that happened to me in a relationship. Mm. I was in a relationship and I was in a relationship for about 10 years. Mm. And wow. in that relationship, the person loved me, just truly loved me. However, there was a dress up, you know, yes. my body. Mm. I was always asked, you know, what are you gonna work out on today? Mm. Why are you asking me that? I mean, you, you don't even hit the gym. You know so did you feel did, like bro. you had to measure up? Like when he says, what are you gonna work out? Like, were you in his mode of, oh, I'm gonna do uh, biceps today? Did you feed into that or no? I didn't feed into it. It was staying on the pedestal. Oh God. You don't wanna go throughout your entire life. You don't wanna climb the ladder of life and then get to the top and realize it's leaning against the wrong building. Wow. What we're happy about is what you brought to this yeah. table, to this house, is love. I mean, we've all felt yeah. it. You, and it sounds like a strong part of your message. Yeah. And we're really grateful for it. And, uh, mm. you know, these conversations always have to eventually come to an end. Right. <laughs> and unfortunately, we're at that place. But, you know, we always <laughs> want to have you back. And we like all of our guests to know that once you come to the house, you're what? Family! <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well. so we and you brought tears to my eyes. Oh. Literally. Thank God. I hate you. I think that you might bad. be the only person in history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. We're happy for you. I might. <laughs>